Hi there. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is the Right to Read initiative. Today, I am very happy to have Rachel Donnelly join me from Maryland, and she is part of the Reading League Maryland, and you are going to talk about your journey with me today. Awesome. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. So I always like to start out with what were your feelings after high school? What did you want to be? Where did you want to go? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I didn't really know much of where I wanted to, uh, to go or anything after high school. I knew I wanted to go to college. And um, so I did that. I went to Binghamton University in upstate New York mm -hmm. and just kind of took a bunch of classes just to see what what might I like. I remember going to like an architecture class and walked out like mid lecture. I was like, nope, that's not going to be it. <laughs> um, and so just tried kind of a, a bunch of things. Um, and it wasn't until um, my sophomore year, I was working on getting all my general education kind of requirements and, and things out of the way, that um, I took a psych course. And that was interesting to me. And I kind of liked that. And, um, you know, I just kind of took a couple more courses and a couple more and just kind of fell into psychology. And then, of course, I was left with the conundrum of, okay, I'm going to graduate soon. What am I going to do with this degree in psychology? Um, and I also got a degree in sociology too, because I just thought it was interesting. So I double majored, but yeah, it was like, what do you, what do, you do with that <laughs> afterwards? Um, so I, I knew that I didn't really want to go the full mile of the doctorate, because that's a lot of work and power to those of you and yourself that they go through all that. Um, but so I was, you know, looking into what, what can you do with a psychology degree? Um, and so I had a friend, my best friend, um, what had a sister who is a school psychologist. And so I learned a little bit about school psychology that um, it can be a specialist degree. So it's a, a three-year degree instead of a five-year degree that sounded more appealing to me. Um, and, you know, trained specifically to do a particular job. So it's a, you know, a particular set of skills. Um, and then you graduate, you know, being able to, to do this thing that, that you've been trained specifically for. So that was appealing to me. And so, yeah, I just kind of fell into school psychology. And most people um, kind of fall into school psychology that way, because it's not something that a lot of people kind of know about. But yeah, after high school, no, no clue what I wanted to do at all. And I, you, you know, if you had asked me, are you going to work with kids? I would be like, no way, I'm not going to work with kids. And if you ask like my mother, like, is Rachel going to work with kids? She'd be like, Rachel doesn't even like kids. Like, <laughs> not really. But you know, I never babysat. I never did any of that when I was um, younger. And so I think it kind of surprised everybody and surprised myself. So here I am. Yeah, well, in the school psychology, unless you experience it, you don't really know about it. Yeah, right? exactly. So mm -hmm. it's not like in the career fairs, at least I never saw a big booth on school psychology. And under, and even as a dyslexic who had, you know, a couple of psychoeducational assessments throughout my education, I never really put the two and two together. Mm hmm uh, so you, you start your professional de degree program in school psychology. Where does that, like, was there something that really fascinated you or were you just kind of happy to go along? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I, I found that I liked it, um, immediately. I mean, it's very kind of data driven and I knew because, you know, I under in undergrad, um, I had gotten into a lab, so I, I did some work with, with some rats in elemental learning and conditioning and, and all that. Um, and so, yeah, I found it very interesting. I liked the data aspect um, that there was, you know, some numbers and things behind um, it. That it's kind of a combination of an art and a, and a science together. Um, but yeah, like you said, like, I feel like a lot of times school psychologists, and I, and I do this too, I do see kids for counseling, mm -hmm. but a lot of, a good portion of my job is, is doing psychoeducational evaluations. And so, you know, I work with a kid, 
briefly, I type up the report, I make recommendations, I sit on the IEP, I, you know, all those things, and then I move on to the next kid. So mm -hmm. I don't get to like kind of form a relationship always with, with families. Um, they might see me again three years later when it's reevaluation time. But yeah, most people don't know about school psychology because oftentimes we're running around testing the kids, consulting um, behavior interventions and things like that. Um, and like I said, a couple, a couple of counseling cases, but um, um, you know, so I, I'm not school counselors, I feel get to make kind of broader connections with the school environment. Um, my school counselors, um, everybody, you know, goes down the hallway and knows the school counselor because they go in and they do guidance lessons and, and, and are more kind of connected, whereas I'm in my office typing my reports. But um, yeah, it's I've, I've, I've liked it, though, because uh, <laughs> I do like that a little bit of the fact that there are some uh, positives to to being able to do that, that I can go in and work with a teacher and, and help with the classroom management and then kind of step back and have, have a break and have a bathroom break and eat my lunch and do all these things. The teachers are kind of, you know, at the subject to staying in the classroom with 20 kids and they don't have a lot of freedom to, to do some of the things that I can do. So. <laughs> Definitely. Well, and then like, so I, I'm not formally a school psychologist. So I have a PhD in educational psychology and special education. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of the school psychology courses uh, during my training. So, you know, I, I can do the testing. Uh, and I did actually help run a reading clinic um, at the university. And I remember just the gratification in helping individuals understand that, look, you know what, you're actually really smart. It's just how you're being asked to work that isn't working for you. And, you know, I, I bet you see that regularly. And then, you know, working with the families that are like, you know, my kid's smart, like there is like, what's happening, and then having that relief. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm sure you come across the parents that are like, Oh, yeah, I had that in school, and then realize it's something that they struggled with, too. And, you know, it may be in fact, the case that they have a learning disability or ADHD or autism or whatever the assessment might be for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a professor once that kind of described the job as being a little bit of a detective, right? So you get yeah. to kind of dig around and kind of make hypotheses and, and test these things out and um, try and try and you know figure out how can you help the kid. And yeah, that's to me it's it's super rewarding um, when I when I'm able to do that. And um, you know I. Um, I, I, I taught my own children to read because out of concern for um, the, the educational system that they were in. And, you know, we, we have concerns with the three queuing and all that. So all that, that was and is my district. Um, and so before they went into school, I was like, OK, we're, with my son, I started in kindergarten. And with my daughter, I said, I'm not even going to wait until kindergarten. We're just going to do this. Um, and yeah, that's super fulfilling to me to be able to sit down and do that. And so when I do get a chance to work with kids on interventions, um, I am always interested in, in that and seeing in that and, and finding the strengths in, in kids. Absolutely. Yeah, no. So at least the school psychology courses that I did, it was a lot of the theory, right? And, mm -hmm. and the background, but not so much the implementation of the interventions aside from saying, okay, so this is the type of intervention that you need. Did your, was your program similar or did you have that background in, you know, the linguistics and the, the cognitive neuroscience? So I, for sure, you know, in undergrad, I took a psycholinguistics course. And so I had kind of a, a little bit of an understanding going into it. Um, the, my coursework wasn't super, so school psychology, because it's a three-year program, and then you're trying to fit in everything <laughs> that needs to be fit in. And it's just kind of, you have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades, because you need to know the threat assessments and risk assessments. And, um, you know, all, there's all these requirements, and there's really just kind of not enough time to get to everything. I was lucky enough that my program had a course on reading. So a course devoted 100% to reading, and it was great. Um, and so, you know, it was focused on the national reading panel. And um, so when I was in school, um, in grad school, 2006 is when I started. So, uh, you know, the national reading panel, you know, had come out, of course. And I, I think that 
the thought would have been that schools are transitioning to, to using some of, some of the things that are there. So, uh, you know, I had a great professor who was able to talk about that and, you know, the, the difference between phonemic awareness and phonological awareness and phonics and, and, and know all that. Um, so, but yeah, we didn't focus so much on how to do interventions. It was more kind of the science, the understanding of what goes into reading, the different components of reading, the pillars of reading. Um, and I got more interested in interventions and curriculum and things like that when, when my kids came of age where they were going into school because you know that I became even more interested and, and kind of concerned um, with what I would see coming back in their backpacks and um, what I know was happening. And so even when I'm in classrooms, because I'm in classrooms a lot doing observations of, of students. And so I'm kind of checking out the curriculum as well. Um, what, <laughs> what's going on there? Um, and so, yeah, I, I can't say that it was something that was like explicitly taught in my program, like how to do an intervention, but we know kind of the components of what went into good instruction. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and was there much of the, the screening and progress monitoring in your program? Yeah, for sure. We had, um, I want to say it was a course on academic assessment, which covered, you know, your formal academic evaluations and also like curriculum based um, assessment as well. So um, Dibbles and Easy CBM and, and all those things. So that was of interest to me. And we had to, you know, for our coursework, plot everything. And it was before, you know, everything was digital and <laughs> would graph for you nicely. And so, yeah, I remember doing that. And then when I went out on um, internship, I inter interned in um, Las Vegas, which was fun. Um, but I, I went into a district that was a, a pure RTI district. So we would have to um, you know, collect our baseline data calculate our slope, our aim line, our trend line, compare rate of growth uh, learning and whatnot to, um, uh, you know, a sample um, and see, you know, are they making expected growth? Is it below expected? And so, um, so yeah, I feel like, um, and not all school, again, school psychology programs are so kind of diverse that, um, you know, mine covered some of this stuff, but it kind of, they're all have their own little, um, orientations and, and how they um, do things. And I don't even think that the reading program that um, the reading course that I participated in when I was there, I don't think that's still taught. I think that went by the wayside because of, um, you know, a bigger focus on school safety and whatnot since then. So, um, well, of course, and really like, thinking back to that time in school, like there's so much happening, there's so much learning being crammed in, even you, though you do a course on it, it's only one of many things you're doing at once. So, but I bet that, did that internship kind of increase your desire to learn more about reading with that RTI model and doing that or at what point? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so, you know, leaving grad school and going out into the field, you have, or at least I had this assumption that, oh, the National Reading Panel says that this is how you teach reading. So this must be how they're all teaching reading. Like, I never really questioned it or thought that, you know, we might not be using effective curriculum. And I didn't honestly think too much about it. So I was kind of focused in my little, you know, working with this one student, graphing the progress, and just assumed that the interventions and um, the curriculum that was being used, the tier one curriculum was, was appropriate for the student. Um, that looking back was probably not the case. I wasn't until I would kind of like, oh, <laughs> had a little bit of a wake up call to know that, that okay, this, this stuff is not uh, as it should be, that I started to pay more attention. I, I spent some time after internship in North Carolina and that was a very heavy testing um, district. So I probably did 120 evaluations in a year. So I really had no time to <laughs> stop and think about curriculum. It was just give an IQ test, give an educational evaluation, give a rating scale or whatnot, and then move on to the next kid. Um, but yeah, I, I've for sure tuned into that more um, now that my, my own kids, and also because um, uh, you know I started a podcast for school psychologists um, with some friends of mine, and um, we get to have these amazing guests. And I know that you know you, your fellow podcaster here, I'm, I'm you know ours is very informal and not as fancy. I assure you, we're very kind of um, you know fly by the seat seat of our pants um, type of thing. But we have we're able to you know we found that. Um, if we reach out to guests and experts in the field, so many people are so um, 
you know, so gracious with their time. And so through that podcast, I've been able to talk to, to so many people, um, David Kilpatrick and Tim Shanahan. And I've, so I've pulled a lot of these people in and, and kind of fed my interest in reading through the podcast. And so um, I'm more kind of up to speed on what's going on because of that. And I really uh, encourage school psychologists to be aware of this stuff because not all school psychologists really are into the reading and, and because it's such a diverse kind of broad field, you know, I have colleagues that social emotional learning is their jam or executive functioning is their thing or, um, you know, um, culturally responsive to like so they, you know, everybody kind of, you know, we have to do all the things in our day to day, but a lot of us kind of pick kind of an interest and dive a little bit deeper into that. And so I'll say that my interest is evidence-based academic, you know, instruction and intervention and whatnot. So not just reading, but um, reading, you know, there's the most research right now behind reading. I think that math is, you know, traveling a little bit in writing. There's not too much <laughs> going on with writing, um, yeah. but certainly enough to know that we're not doing it as we should in math, reading, or in writing. Yeah, but there, you know, there's starting to be some cracks in the clouds, right? We are making some progress. Now, those first few years, when you, I think you're saying like you're doing like 120 assessments mm. a year, was there a trend that you began to see in the students that you're being referred? Um, you know, and I'm trying to think back because I feel like it was like forever ago. Um, I'm not sure is that I noticed any trends. It was just, you know, if a student was, wasn't was achieving as they should, let's refer to special education. Um, so again, I'm not sure about the quality of the interventions that we kind of ruled everything out before it got to there. And I wasn't in a position, you know, I was new and fresh out of grad school. And so they say, oh, here, you have a case, test this kid. I say, okay, <laughs> sure. Now in my career, I'm more like, okay, well, you know, what what intervention have they had? Have they been here in school? What's what's the uh, the educational history been? How, do they have good vision and hearing? Like, do they need glasses? Like, what are some things that we need to make sure are in place that are kind of fundamental things that kids need to be able to learn to read, to be able to learn anything? Um, and so, making sure that that's um, that that's in line. But yeah. I, trying to think of, of <laughs> trends or or patterns or uh, anything but it was just mostly like test 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 was what it was so yeah now as, as you're saying you're getting a little bit more aware mm -hmm. of what's coming in I know I've spoken to several school psychologists that are more informed in the reading field and they're they said that they're struggling sometimes to give a diagnosis of a specific learning disorder, which is what the DSM calls it, because they're not able to eliminate that need for quality instruction in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so all of our paperwork, um, when I'm, you know, working under IDA here in the States, as far as special education, you know, the mm -hmm. SLD criteria, um, you know, has they have to, it can't be due to a lack of instruction in reading or in math. And so it's kind of a tech checkbox on all of our forms. And we go through the paperwork as a team. And every I've never had a team that's been like, oh yeah, they haven't had appropriate instruction because teams and schools kind of internalize this as if I check this, this means that I've I've not done my job. I've not educated the child. Like they're in school. Of course, they've had appropriate instruction. And so this concept of appropriate instruction has come to be like, have you been in a classroom with an appropriately licensed and credentialed teacher? And that's really all that, that it means. And so we don't have those hard conversations um, at the IEP table because I think it's an uncomfortable conversation. And if it's brought up that mm, this isn't the appropriate maybe intervention to target the school, the skill deficit, or maybe this isn't an evidence-based intervention, or, you know, it's kind of a messy, yeah, it's hard to rule these things out. At the same time, uh, it would be hard to sit at an IEP table and say, nobody has SLD because we don't have our acts together. And that would certainly be a disservice to kids that have true disabilities. And so I, I don't really know what the answer is to that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as an individual who has been diagnosed with dyslexia, and I, I have a, a child with dyslexia, uh, I think that diagnosis is very important. 
But I also know instances where it's purely a case of the, the child just needed that phonological awareness instruction that they didn't get in the classroom. As soon as they got it, there was that quick mm-hmm. that we want, don't want to label or not label them, but di- misdiagnose as a specific learning disorder or SLD, because really it's not. It's they just haven't had that key component to their constru- instruction. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell teams a lot, you know, a kid can be struggling academically for so many reasons. I mean, we've had COVID shutdowns. It can be lack of instruction. It can be poor instruction. It could be they're absent from school. They can't see, they can't hear. They There's so many explanations for you know trauma and home life and social mm-hmm. emotional needs and, and all these things um and sld is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion right so you rule out as much as you can it's not due to this it's not due to this it's not this so it must be sld um and yeah it's it's hard to um because we don't have a, a blood test you know there's not a let's go to the doctor and oh you have sld and so we know um, and the criteria, as you know, is, is pretty um, gray. I mean, it's kind of, there's not a, you have to score this score in this area. It, it is very gray and it needs to be very gray, I think, because it manifests in so many different ways. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's a tricky position to be in to like tease out all these things. And again, you know, you only get so much information about the student and, you know, teachers getting forms and forms and parents getting forms and then compiling all the information. I think one thing that a lot of people don't appreciate is how much time and effort goes into doing a full psychiatric report. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, there are a few hours of the testing. But then it's scoring. I mean, luckily now everything's computerized. (laughs) Uh, But back in the day when you had to go through the um scoring manuals and get the raw convert the raw score to the standard score and then the percentiles and then (laughs) all that by hand it took a lot of time and it still does take a lot of time to get the scores and then have a serious thought about the scores and how they relate to the story that you get from the parents and from the teachers and from the school and then put that into your recommendations and um, then there's the, how detailed do I go in my report, mm-hmm. right? Because I can write, or a school psychologist can write an amazingly detailed report that's full of so much information, but then the teacher or the family gets this report that they don't understand. They're just going to look at and close off. I'm like, okay, well, we'll just go to the end for the diagnosis and the recommendations. Yes. And that's what people do. And, you know, school sex are very well aware of that, that uh, nobody reads our, we joke, that nobody reads our reports. And if they do, it's just, you know, the summary and yeah. maybe looking at the recommendations. And so I've tried to be, as I've, you know, gone through my career, um, aware of that and try to be succinct and yeah. make sure that I'm highlighting things that are really important. Um, you know, earlier in my career, it was, you know, you give a cognitive, you give an educational, you know, you, you do these things. Um, you know, honestly, I'm not sure how much information you get out of a cognitive evaluation compared to the educational and CBM and, and that type of data. Like if a kid doesn't, is having a hard time reading, the most important thing to do should be to sit down with them and listen to them read and, mm-hmm. and you know, take some data on that, you know, or reading fluency or your phonics inventory or phonemic awareness screener to figure out what those missing skills are. Mm-hmm. I don't care so much about the cognitive evaluation um, as much as the educational. And so like my, my reports do kind of focus in on the curriculum-based measurement, um, curriculum-based assessment to figure out what does this look like and how is this manifesting in the classroom? You know, so it's one thing to sit down with a kid in your office and to test them and to do these little skills, but it's another thing then to be in the curriculum amidst, you know, a classroom of 20 other kids. Um, And so, you know, generalizing this performance within, you know, my little office and figuring out what that means in the classroom is sometimes it's a very different animal oftentimes. So I feel like observations in the classroom and that teacher report and triangulating your data and, and getting multiple data points and, and seeing those individual academic skills is more important to me than um, 
than some of the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, it all depends where the family's at because then some families are in the position where they can hire an interventionist mm -hmm. or consultant to help go into it further. Because as a school psychologist, your time is very valuable and I'm sure you have a wait list. Uh, so it, it's not like you can repeatedly see that family and talk about what's happening and going on and really track that student along. But for me, what I find most fascinating when I go through the psych ed, just because I understand them, mm -hmm. is looking at the actual scoring and the observations during the assessment mm -hmm. that you have and, and pulling that out and really saying, oh, okay, well, that helps me understand this, that, and the other thing. But then as a school psychologist, you're like, well, when maybe two, 3% of the reports that I write, someone's actually going to go through that. Is it worth it? Right. Do you just do the, the quick fact sheet for, you know, the, the schools and the families that they're going to get the most out of this information? Mm -hmm. I've taken to do kind of um, screenings. Mm -hmm. um, I call screenings um, and through our, our intervention process. So instead of, you know, waiting for them to get through the intervention process, everybody's kind of like, oh, we don't know what to do. So we're going to refer to special education. And then I step in, you know, trying to come kind of ahead of, you know, sitting in those intervention team meetings and saying, oh, like, do you not, do you know what you need to focus on? And oftentimes the team is like, well, well they can't comprehend. And I'm like, well, why do you think they can't comprehend? Well, I don't know, they can't comprehend. So I'm like, okay, well, let me, you know, give me half an hour with the kid. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll sit down, I'll do phonemic awareness, I'll do phonics, I'll do fluency. We'll see if, if any of those are intact. If those are all intact and everything's like jiving good, then yeah, maybe it's a language problem. Maybe there's a background knowledge problem. Maybe there's, you know, something going on more often than not. I find that the kid can't really read, <laughs> you know, so we're blaming like comprehension. It's like, well, they can't comprehend because they can't get the words off the paper. And so doing those kind of little screeners um, and kind of a quick type up to the team and parent that like, this is where the problem is. And this is where you should really focus your instruction um, to make sure that we're getting kind of the appropriate intervention and quality intervention. Um, and the teacher knows what's to focus on in the limited time that we have in the school setting. Um, and parents often, you know, want to know what can I do at home um, if I can get myself in there and do that consult kind of um, thing, you know, before we get to special education. I'm finding that that is useful and maybe a better use of my time in some cases. Yeah, of course. Now let's go back to your journey because we're going to be talking more about your role. <laughs> Sorry, we <laughs> sidetracked. <laughs> You know, of course, I, I kind of steered you that way anyway, so that's my fault. So obviously, at some point, you, you mentioned that when your children started becoming of school age and reading rage, that you started to get more interested in reading and teaching reading. So where did that process start for you? I mean, because you had the background, I'm assuming, of the National Reading Panel Report by that point, had you? Yeah, so you had you had an understanding that there are five pillars, keys, whatever, to literacy, the phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, um, fluency, and comprehension, which as, as a school psychologist, you would know as well. But where did you start diving deeper into your journey as a parent and a professional trying to learn more about the reading instruction piece? Yeah, I mean, so my, my son entered kindergarten and, you know, I, we know that uh, there's going to be a certain percentage of kids that are just going to just going to pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. I had no reason to think that he would have difficulties. There's not a family history. Um, um, I didn't see any indicators earlier on, um, you know, and so I was kind of like, oh, we'll, we'll let him, we'll let the teachers do their thing. I'm not going to step on their toes, right? Um, and he came home with sight word packets. And I was like, okay, like, it's kind of like random sight words. And so I started, okay, you want to, this is what we're working on. And he, I mean, and he's a good kid. He, he's not easy to frustration, but man, when I pulled out those sight words, it was, nah! <laughs> it was, you know, because he, He's used to things, I think, coming easy to him. And here I am presenting this task that didn't make sense to him because he hadn't been taught, right? And he clearly hadn't been taught how to decode these words. It was just, let's memorize these words. And it was just kind of a mess. And so I was like, okay, fine, no, I'm not. I did like one through one 
go through with the sight word, saw the frustration and said, no, we're not doing this. So I immediately went on to um, Amazon Mm -hmm. and got the uh, teach a child to read in a hundred easy lessons from Siegfried Engelman. Great program. I'm a huge fan of direct instruction. I know that lots of people are very much OG oriented um, and I appreciate OG, but if I had to pick, I would go with DI all the way. So much research behind it, more so um, than any other programs really. And so, um, you know, I got that book and we went through that book and um, in less than a hundred days, cause he was so into it and he enjoyed it so much. And he was so proud. I mean, I have a video of him finishing the hundredth lesson um, and it brings you to about a second grade reading level. So he's, you know, in kindergarten. Um, And he was just, he was like hugging the book and he just loved it so much. And it was so great. And I would reward him with um, stickers if he did a lesson. And oftentimes it would be like, okay, it's bedtime, good night. Or would you like to stay up a little later and do a lesson with me? And be like, yeah, let's stay up later, do the lessons. (laughs) It's just kind of funny. Um, And so, yeah, I I loved that. I had so much fun teaching him um, and it was so effective. It was so very highly effective. So yeah, when my daughter, um, my daughter was at kind of an in-between age for entry into kindergarten where um, we could test her in for an early admission process. And I knew that to test in on, it was like the CSAT or something. Um, she would have to, if, if I could get her to read before she took this test, she would ace the test. I knew that. And so I was like, well, <laughs> we're going to start with you a little bit early. And so, yeah, she was four years old um, when I started and she went through it beautifully. Um, they're both amazing readers, well below, well above grade level at this point. Um, she's in second grade and she can read basically anything you put in front of her. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was just, the process was so easy and was so highly effective that I was like, oh man, like, I want to share this with everybody. It was a great experience for for me and for my kids. And I'm just like, I want every child to have this. Like, how could you not want every child to have this? And so, yeah. I'm sure it's that magic when they, when they finally get it. Yeah. Right. Whether the age and like, so, uh, you know, I have, I have three children, one severely dyslexic, one is, and then the third is one of those ones that picked up reading very, very quickly, very, very easily. I spent like six, maybe, I don't know, it was like 15 minutes. Was it a, we were at an appointment with one of my other kids and they were in getting stuff done. And I just taught her sat pin when she was like, just turned four and she picked it up. No problem. She's like reading left and right. And I'm like, oh. At least one of them's not struggling. Cool. <laughs> I didn't pass on my genetics to all. <laughs> but that's that's amazing and it's contagious. It is. Right. It was, yeah. And so I wanted to like go around, like, I mean, I bought, I don't know how many copies of that book and was like, you get a copy and you get a copy. And so it's like, cause I see this, in, these ineffective strategies used in the classroom all the time. And they spend so much time on reading. I mean, it's like an hour and a half on Mm -hmm. reading every day. And I'm just like, I could be more effective in 15 or 20 minutes of time with an effective evidence-based instructional program here mm-hmm. than, than you're, you're, you could devote that all that extra time to social studies and science and building background knowledge and writing. We spend like 20 minutes a day on writing. That's not sufficient. We need at least 45 minutes for the research. And so, you know, if I if ruled the world, I would rearrange the whole kind of day and mm-hmm. use really highly effective instructional practices so that we could be, you know, time is so valuable in the school day there's really just and so you want to use it and you don't want to wear the kids out I mean this 100 lessons book I mean it's a one-on-one program so that's a different animal than like a whole class Mm -hmm. type of thing um but yeah I mean it's 15 20 minutes a day and you know to sit and and do much longer than that we know that you know kids need breaks we know that interleaving we need to switch up tasks we know that practice across um across time is more effective than than lumped all a whole bunch at once so spreading it out you know across several days um you know all this science of learning really that we're just not at least over in in my schools and in the U.S. we're just not paying any attention to and I see it in math and I see it in writing and it's just um it's just sad, but yeah, I mean, direct instruction with that, that hundred lessons book is direct instruction. There's a whole, there's a class-wide version of direct instruction. We've got, you know, reading mastery. We've got interventions in direct instruction. We've got reading, uh, corrective reading. So, I mean, it's not like these programs are 
not available. You know, the, mm. they're, they're out there. We just, schools are just not using them. Well, and teachers need the knowledge to do it. And, and that's the problem. And just think what your caseload would be like mm -hmm. if we had this implemented from day one. Yeah. Think about how the Matthew effect would barely exist mm -hmm. and how much better all of these students would be, especially yeah. the struggling readers that are NLS, right? Mm -hmm. reading disability not that otherwise specified they don't meet the criteria for a specific learning disorder in reading or writing or mathematics but it's an nos case You're like oh yeah there's something wrong but we're just not quite sure what mm -hmm. um and you know that's really gonna make the biggest bang for your buck as far as schools go as far as, as, far as your time because if you're not having to do all these psychoeducational assessments, which are extremely time consuming. I mean, unless you have this magic spell that other school psychologists don't know about, um, or it's just a, a tap of a wand and you have everything you need and the report's written. Um, only. <laughs> only. Exactly. Um, think about what you could be doing with your time and helping support in the classroom and teaching the progress monitoring, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you've gone from supporting your children on the reading path to, you know, being involved in the reading league. And I'm assuming there's something in between. Yeah. So it's interesting. So when, so my, my district where, where my kids are and where I work is um, very Fontes and Pinnell is very embedded there. And so I've seen kind of, the F and P testing season, hmm. you know, under underway. So it's, you know, it, it's such a time consuming test for such a little bit of information that's really not reliable, right? And so I and I see, so they hire sub to substitutes for all the classroom teachers. And so the classroom teacher sits out in the hallway or wherever they can find space and they test a kid and they test a kid and they just test, go through their whole class. Well, the substitutes in there kind of giving them busy work, giving them worksheets, the kids are running all around. It's just such not an efficient use of time. And, um, and money too. I mean, you're paying all these substitute teachers. We don't have enough substitute teachers. You're, you're stressing teachers out. It's not, again, you talked about like bang for your buck. You're not getting your worthwhile out of this time that you're investing, you know, if an hour a kid to test, you know, you got 20 kids, it's, it's just out of control. And so even though I wasn't concerned for my own kids, I was very mindful of, I don't want to contribute to this whole mess that we do this three times a year and it's just an inefficient waste of time. And so um, I wrote a letter and requested that they be opted out. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want my kids tested, not concerned with their reading, you know, read with them, do whatever. I, I don't want to know their level. I don't, I don't want to know. I don't care. And I don't think anyone should know their level because it's not really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and that was met with some pushback. So, um, you know, I was declined. First, it was at like kind of the building. Admit first, it was a reading specialist. Said, no, I don't think we can do that. Bumped it up to the principal. No, we can't do that. Then I go to, you know, assistant superintendent. I kind of work my way up the up the chain of just being denied to opt out a test. Mm -hmm. um, they say it's a district requirement. It's what we do. Um, I made a whole list of resources. Um, the Matt Burns has published three articles on Fontes and Pinnell, the benchmark assessment system to show and that shows that it's not an effective um, assessment psychometrically. Um, it does, it's not useful. Um, and so I had this letter crafted and with all these references and a big stack of paper and links and, and all these things. And so I'm going, working my way up the chain, kind of presenting my case. And yeah, eventually I got to the superintendent and he sat there with his, um, you know, one of the assistant superintendents and just defended f and and said, you know, we sat around this conference table years ago and we had a good conversation and we all felt that this is the appropriate program. And so I'm just like, 
I understand that, but that doesn't mean you made the right decision. And we also need to like think about, I, I feel like people invest so much. It's money, it's millions of dollars, it's time. It would have to be admitting that, oh wait, I made a mistake. I bought this curriculum that's not effective. And that's hard to do. And so, and plus he, he kind of admitted to me that, well, I'm a high school teacher by, by trade. I don't really know much about reading. And I'm just like, ah, superintendent saying that he doesn't know anything about reading. You're killing me. But he kind of, you know, deferred to his people and was like, we, we like, we like the running records. They give us so much information. We like how this, and, and so it was just, I, I didn't get anywhere. So I got denied there. And, um, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Did you use the response? I'm a school psychologist. Oh, they definitely knew I was a school psychologist for sure. That was that was definitely I, I threw out all the all the things, yeah, <laughs> to try and. Um, I'm aware of where my children are at. Yeah, <laughs> I don't need your test. You know, and I know that parents ha are able to opt out of certain things. Um, like we have 13 reasons why, right? Of the the book that. Um, is in our curriculum for reading and parents are able to opt out of that. Um, and so I'm just like, how is this different? Why can't I opt out of, and there was nonsense. They couldn't really give me a reason other than I think they, they didn't want to open the can of worms of other people opting out probably. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sat at that meeting and I was very frustrated. And at that point, I had also kind of connected a little bit with some people in decoding dyslexia, some of the dyslexia advocacy groups who were really fired up about this as well. And I kind of said to the uh, superintendent and the regional superintendent, like, I feel like you're backing me into a corner. I feel like you're forcing me to advocate even harder for this. You're forcing me to, to go and rally the troops, <laughs> like you're, you're being unreasonable. And, and why, why are you doing this? And they just, you know, I was kind of like, I'm, oh, I kind of said that I would back off and leave them be if they just do this one thing for me. I'm retroactively, I'm not sure that I <laughs> would have backed off. Um, but at the time I was like, I, I will leave this alone if you just let me opt out my kids. Um, and they were just kind of like, yeah, no, go do your thing, do your worst. <laughs> so um, that kind of, when the Reading League put out a call for, we want to do state chapters, I was like, <laughs> here I am, this is it. And um, connected with, with a lot of people through the decoding dyslexia groups and whatnot and other educators and, um, you know, helped to get the chapter established, which was its own you know, nonprofit paperwork and, and whatnot, um, difficult. <laughs> but um, now I feel like, you know, that, that fire that they lit in me and forced upon me um, has been channeled a little bit into the Reading League, which allows us to, to make things, you know, to, to advocate on a bigger scale than what I was able to do, you know, on my own, kind of stomping my feet in the superintendent's office. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's tireless work of banging your head on the wall. Um, but definitely thank you for doing it. Uh, it's, you know, what's best for our children. Um, now, the role that we haven't talked about is your role as a mom. And all moms, I hear mom talk at the playground. And based on like your children were fine, but did you, did you hear those parents? within your, your children's classes, within your child's, their school, where they're saying, well, this isn't working, like what's happening? Like my kid's not reading, especially because your kids were right at that learning to read stage during COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of parents woke up. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, like I said, I would buy that hundred lessons book and like all my friends and stuff, I was like, here, don't count on the school to teach you here. Like anybody that had a reading, problem. I was like, take this book. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's unfortunate because I really think that it's the educational system's duty and responsibility to teach kids to read, to educate kids. It shouldn't be the parent's job. Yeah. And, and it is just creates more inequities when, you know, my kids, I, I, I was able to teach them because I, this is what I do and I, and I know about this, but there's parents out there that, you know, the 
the schools, oh, give them more time, da, 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 you know, and just, it, and it's unfair because it's not that parent's job to have to, to do this. The, you're sending your kids to school to learn. They should be able to learn. They should have access to these evidence-based instructional practices. And um, so, yeah, it's very frustrating to me. And then, yeah, I look at my situation and just know how lucky and privileged my kids are. And my husband is a, is a teacher, he's a math teacher. I mean, in COVID, we were like, hey, <laughs> this is- You get a team. <laughs> yeah, cool. the schools are shut down. I'm like, okay, well, I've got a plan. Like, I'm gonna do this and you're gonna do this. And we, I mean, so yeah, very privileged from, from that background. And it's unfortunate that, that other families are put in that situation where it's kind of either do it yourself and figure it out or you're just out of luck. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Now, where do you see your journey going in the future with, with your work that you're currently doing as a school psychologist and with the Reading League? Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm just glad that the Reading League Maryland is now off the ground and running. Like that was, you know, I, I, I wanted us to have a chapter and we didn't have a chapter. And so I was kind of like, oh, well, I guess I got to make a chapter. Um, <laughs> I will say that, you know, I, I'm, I'm the president and I feel like there's other people that would do a better job of being president. I, I wish that I could just sit back and be the advisor. And I think that's probably my next uh, stage is because I'm not so good with the organization and the planning and, and all these things. I love that I'm surrounded by these super capable, competent people who are really good. And, and with, you know, with the nonprofit stuff, we've been so lucky that we have people that that know about taxes, <laughs> that people that know, uh, you know, about um, social media, that people like it, it, to, to form this chapter, you would think you need all these people that know about reading, but really you don't, you need like a little bit of people <laughs> that know about reading. And then you need kind of a village around them of people that have all these other skills. Mm -hmm. And so um, I feel like I, I would, you know, I, I'm glad that the Reading League and I'm in a four year term and I'm going to do the best to get things like going. And then I would personally love to say kind of sit into an advisory position and, and watch it kind of grow, because um, I think there are people that can do a better job at some of this stuff than I can. But I, I yeah, I'd like to have the Reading League be um, a, a good resource for teachers and to have close working relationships with school districts. Um, and to um, be able to do that advocacy and at the state level with, um, you know, curriculum recommend, well, Reading League doesn't do curriculum recommendations. We have like a rubric that should can help you figure out is this a good curriculum or not. We don't endorse particular curriculums. Um, but yeah, like get everybody kind of going in the right direction. Um, that's, that would be my, <laughs> my wish. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Rachel. I really enjoyed our conversation about your journey, and I look forward to our upcoming conversations about your role as a school psychologist and the Reading League Maryland. Yeah. Uh, thank talk you so to much. You.